Toads beware, you're looking for adventure Well this is it, with Jenny, Dead Eye, Blinky And Willie to win Bucky, Captain Bucky O'Hare You say Bucky, it's Bucky O'Hare Let's croak us some toads 1992's Bucky O'Hare for the Nintendo Entertainment System is something of an anomaly for NES-era Konami. Instead of being a straight port of their arcade game, Konami decided to take a different approach, making it a unique and ultimately more interesting experience. Well, okay, unique might be pushing it, but the question is, does it manage to maintain its righteous indignation, or is it just another part of the evil complex? This is Chris from Mako Powered, and welcome to Weekend Rental, where we look at games that, while not widely considered classics, or sometimes even good, are still worth examining and maybe even playing despite themselves. So I know that the Hulk PS2 video teased that this one would be about Vice Project Doom. That video is still coming. The reason we switched up the order though is that, shortly after the Hulk video was posted, I learned that Neil Adams had sadly passed away. Since we were already planning a Bucky O'Hare video, it seemed appropriate that we go ahead with that instead to commemorate the legendary comic book artist. Even if you're unfamiliar with Adams the Man, you are more than likely familiar with his work. It was Adams' take on Batman, with Denny O'Neill writing, that brought the character back to his darker pulp roots after the camp pop art take of the Adam West TV series. Not that there's anything wrong with the TV series, I unironically love it. In fact, it would be O'Neill and Adams who would create one of Batman's biggest villains, Raj Al Ghul. The duo also tackled drug addiction in their famous high-profile Green Lantern, Green Arrow cover and story from 1971. Adams's art has defined or redefined heroes like Superman, the X-Men, Deadman, the Avengers, and more for generations of pop culture fans. This doesn't even include the fact that Adams has long been an advocate for comic creators' rights, spearheading the campaign for DC to finally recognize Siegel and Schuster as the creators of Superman in the 70s, and co-founding the Comic Creators Guild. On top of that, there was his Holocaust survivor advocacy work, which he campaigned for well into the 2000s. Sure, there was his weird belief that the Earth was... expanding by... creating matter at its core or his related theory that the Earth was hollow, something that he translated into one of the downright weirdest Batman comics of all time, where Batman descends into that hollow area to find a lost world. While extremely odd, these unsubstantiated beliefs appear to have been relatively harmless compared to the good that he did throughout his life. At this point, you're probably wondering how a video on a 1992 NES game could serve as a commemoration of Neil Adams. Well, let me explain. Bucky O'Hare, the comic book, was created in 1977-1978 by Larry Hama, who you might know from his work on Wolverine, or from being the sole writer of the G.I. Joe comic from 1982 to 1994, and Michael Golden, who has worked on Micronauts, The Avengers, The X-Men, and more. The concept ultimately wouldn't see publication until 1984, when it became one of the flagship titles for Continuity Comics, the comics company Neil Adams founded in order to make sure creators maintain the rights to their work, and which exists in a modified form to this day. Because of the delay between creation and publication, Bucky O'Hare would coincidentally find himself on comic racks at around the same time as another comic about anthropomorphic animals in a seriously toned comic, The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This would not be the first time the two would tie into each other. The thing is, while Bucky O'Hare does take its inspiration from another comic about another anthropomorphic animal, it isn't turtles, but a duck. Specifically, Howard the Duck. Nope, not that one. That one. See, Howard the Duck was created by Steve Gerber as a way of venting his frustrations about the comic book industry, comic book writing, and capitalism in general, all wrapped in a fourth wall breaking existential crisis. Bucky O'Hare shares those critiques of capitalism, but frames them as a Looney Tunes populated space opera, with a fourth wall breaking existential crisis. The comic isn't shy about its anti-capitalist bent either. The evil toad empire which Bucky and his crew fight against came about through voracious consumerism. This consumerism turned literally mindless with the creation of the capitalist machine complex and spread across the Anniverse wholly consuming other planets, cultures, and species. So, how did a comic book from 1984 that served as a thinly veiled critique of capitalism get a tie-in video game in 1992? That's where the Ninja Turtles come back into the picture. 
After the Ninja Turtles popularity exploded following the release of the initial cartoon and toys in 1987 and 1988 respectively, everyone wanted a piece of that success. Konami had the license for Ninja Turtles games by 1988, and they took full advantage of it, releasing three games for the NES, well, four if you count tournament fighters, two for arcades, three for the Game Boy, and one each for the SNES and Sega Genesis. Again, two if we're counting tournament fighters. All the same, the Turtles' popularity was starting to wane in the early 90s, and there were attempts to replicate the Turtles' success with other indie or obscure licensed characters. That's why we got NES games like Toxic Crusaders, Swamp Thing, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and more. Konami itself would try to replicate their success with the Turtles games with the likes of Zen Intergalactic Ninja, which we are definitely coming back to in a future video, Monster in My Pocket, and Bucky O'Hare. Whew, okay, that was a lot of background for this game, but it was necessary. What about the game itself, though? Well, as mentioned, the NES was not the only platform Konami would bring Bucky O'Hare to. Unlike the arcade game, however, which was very clearly, um, inspired by their earlier success with the Ninja Turtles franchise in arcades, the NES game pulls its influences from one of Konami's competitors, Capcom. Bucky O'Hare plays like nothing less than Konami's attempt to make a Mega Man game. This doesn't mean that it doesn't do anything interesting, it's just that it kind of heavily wears its inspirations on its sleeve. For one thing, the initial half of the game is structured like a Mega Man game in that it gives the player the choice of the order in which to tackle its four opening worlds. Sort of. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because first we need to discuss the premise for the game. We're not going to worry about a spoiler alert though because it's not particularly intricate or engrossing. Basically, Bucky's ship, the Righteous Indignation, is attacked by the Toad Armada, all of the crew is kidnapped, and it's up to Bucky and the player to rescue them from the planets on which they're being held hostage. Like I said, not exactly high literature, but hey, it sets up the game, so it's fine. It's fine. Anyway, yeah, the player is given the choice of which order they want to approach the worlds in, but much like, say, Power Blade 1 and 2, it's highly recommended you take them in order from smallest to largest. The reason for this is because the planet's sizes indicate their relative length and difficulty. The green planet, which houses Blinky the android, is the shortest and easiest of the four, which makes it a good starting point. By contrast, however, the yellow planet, which is holding human Willy DeWitt against his will, is significantly longer and more arduous to complete. In other words, there are two things going on with this level slash world selection. On the one hand, it clearly indicates the difficulty curve, by which the later non-selectable planets will become hard as nails. Seriously, look at the section from the yellow planet. And provides a visual indicator of that difficulty curve in the size of the planets. On the other hand, it allows the player to customize the level of challenge they face at the beginning. If the player wants to just jump in and go for a greater challenge, that option is there. Just start with the yellow planet first. Tied to this level select dynamic is the fact that the player does earn additional abilities when bosses are defeated, they just aren't the boss's abilities. Instead, each time a level boss is defeated, Bucky recovers one of his crewmates, all of whom come with distinctive weapons of their own and unique special abilities. Blinky, the aforementioned android rescued from the green planet, doesn't have a proper firearm like the rest of the crew. Instead, he lobs his shots in an arc, which can be used for enemies out of reach of the other character's weapons, and to break otherwise indestructible blocks throughout the levels. He also has a built-in rocket pack, which allows him to fly for a set amount of time. Deadeye Duck, the main weaponier of the crew trapped on the red planet, fires a three-way shot, reminiscent of Contra's spread gun, and his ability is... to... Stick to walls? I'm not sure why, because he's, well, a duck. Maybe it's because he has four arms, so the devs thought he was insect-like? I don't know, I got nothing. Moving on, Jenny, the feline psychic held captive on the blue planet, fires a beam from her forehead and casts a telekinetic ball that can be controlled during its flight. In fact, it controls a lot like Ness's PK Thunder from the Super Smash Bros. series. Finally, Willie DeWitt, the ten-year-old human engineer of the crew, comes away from the yellow planet firing a beam gun that can be powered up to pass through multiple enemies and walls. Oh, and because Bucky O'Hare is a, well, hare, his special ability is to make large leaps. 
There is an issue with these abilities that the player would not encounter with a Mega Man game, though. Instead of just going into a menu and activating the abilities that way, the player has to cycle through the available crew members using the select button. Okay, that's a little annoying, but no big deal, right? The problem is that in order to use each crew member's unique ability, it needs to be charged up by holding down the B button first. The same B button used for basic attacks. Doing so prevents the player from firing while the special ability charges. This means that if there's, say, time-sensitive platforming, but also a wave of enemies, the player cannot take on both of them easily and will almost certainly either take damage or lose a life. There is another interesting aspect to these special abilities, however, that sets them apart from Mega Man. While Mega Man has limited uses of the abilities he gains from bosses, or Rush, the Righteous Indignation crew can use their abilities whenever they want. What they do need to do, though, is power them up Gradius style by grabbing icons throughout the stages so that they last longer. Okay, maybe the Gradius comparison isn't entirely fair. You don't lose the power boosts when you lose a life, but it's still, at the very least, an echo of Konami's earlier game. Speaking of, there are actually a few aspects of the levels which are directly lifted from other Konami games. Most notably, the Fire Coronas on the Red Planet are very clearly the same ones from Life Force, Konami's 1988 follow-up to Gradius. Likewise, several of the background tiles are just recolored blocks from Castlevania 3. Add to that the pastiches taken from Mega Man, like the lava flows that are eerily reminiscent of the power beams from Flashman's stage in Mega Man 2, the disappearing blocks which have harried Mega Man players since the beginning of the series, and even an area where the lights go out except for small enemies providing their own light sources, Shades of Shadow Man's stage in Mega Man 3, and the proceedings start to feel, let's be nice and say, familiar. Sort of. See, things get interesting and take a left turn after the player finishes the four planets and rescues Bucky's crew. Once all four planets are completed, it's revealed that it was all a trap to capture Bucky himself. Why would the Toads need to go to such elaborate lengths when they could have just captured him in the intro along with everyone else? Don't worry about it! What you should be focusing on is the fact that once everyone is captured, including Bucky this time, the game suddenly shifts gears. As Bucky and Blinky move through the bowels of the giant toad magma tanker, no, really, that's what it's called, trying to find and free the rest of the crew, the game turns into a maze where each freed crew member's abilities allow for access to more areas. Yeah, that's right, it almost becomes a Metroidvania. Almost, but not quite, because the areas are connected by elevators, and where you end up is a matter of which doors you go through leading to different elevators. Still though, it's a cool change of pace after four levels of Mega Man style action. Sure, the game becomes linear again after all of the crew are freed, but that's because your mission then becomes straightforward. Start a chain reaction that destroys the magma tanker and escape to tell the tale. This section also has some of the most personality of the entire game since you're in the heart of enemy territory. As you navigate through the magma tanker, you'll come across TV screens, some of which show the warts galore spokes model from the first episode of the cartoon. Others show the Toad Air Marshal talking directly to Bucky and the player. Look at this guy, calling out, telling you he hates you. This is really fun. Well, to me at any rate. There's more personality after you destroy the tanker's core, too. Bucky jumps on a hovercraft to escape the impending explosion, the gameplay changes yet again, and the last part of the game becomes a side-scrolling shooter. Like... um... Gradius. Here though, while there are enemies that are trying to shoot you down, there are also a bunch of toads that will impede your progress by jumping onto your hovercraft and hanging there, trying to hitch a ride out of the tanker and save themselves before it explodes. I honestly feel bad for these dudes because they're just trying to escape with their lives as well. Even when fighting the penultimate boss, there will be toads abandoning ship to try escaping on your craft. And that's kind of the thing with Bucky O'Hare presented as a kid's property, isn't it? In the game, you kill a lot of toads. In the cartoon, the catchphrase for the crew is, Let's croak some toads. I mean, sure, a ragtag band of diverse rebels fighting against an oppressive vampire is going to wind up being violent, but I guess that violence is more palatable to present to kids as long as it's in the form of cartoon animals, right? Let's be clear, the comic book was never really intended for kids, which, to be fair, really none of Larry Hama's writing is. Not even his G.I. Joe run, which has more in common with his comic The Nam, based on his experiences in the Vietnam War, than it does with the more kid-friendly G.I. Joe cartoon. Oh, quick aside, 
Can we just take a moment to acknowledge that the structure of the game is basically Star Wars? Like, A New Hope? You start out assembling your, as mentioned, ragtag band of rebels in order to fight an evil empire, wind up trapped in their gigantic space base, and have to stop them by detonating the core of said base before escaping. Again, it feels... familiar. Going back to the issue of Cartoon Animal on Cartoon Animal Violence, the final boss sees the player one-on-one -on -one against the Toad Air Marshal, as the exploding core chases them both through the corridors of the ship. Unlike the cartoon, where the Air Marshal would definitely need to survive to remain an ongoing antagonist, here the player straight up makes him explode before escaping. The ending cutscene doesn't even hint that he's alive. It just says that one victory will not stop the Toad oppression, but that Bucky and his crew will keep fighting for freedom. That is actually a kind of morose ending, despite the upbeat music. It's basically saying, hey, you beat the leader of the enemy armada. That doesn't actually stop the enemy armada, though, so, um, keep at it. Um, hooray? Oh, before we finish up, we should talk about the game's legacy, which is either awesome or ignoble, depending on your perspective. See, the game's director and co-designer was Masato Nagawa, Megawa had been with Konami for years, working on such titles as Super Castlevania 4 and Contra 3 The Alien Wars. Bucky O'Hare would be Megawa's last game for Konami before leaving to found Treasure. You know, the studio behind games like Gunstar Heroes, Guardian Heroes, Mischief Makers, another game we need to come back to on this show, Ikaruga, and more. The reason Megawa left to form Treasure? He wanted to work on original games, and was tired of being forced to work on endless sequels and licensed games. Licensed games like Bucky O'Hare. He would also wind up taking most of the staff who worked on Bucky O'Hare with him to Treasure when all was said and done. So yeah, awkward. Bucky O'Hare for the NES may not be made up of the most original components, but what it does with those elements makes it worth checking out. The elements it borrows from other games and franchises are well done, and combined in ways that make the overall experience more than just a Me Too licensed game, more so than the arcade game it shares a name with. Sure, this might have been the final straw which led to the formation of Treasure, but there is enough of Treasure's DNA here that it is a fast, frenetic, tough-as-nails, but still fun experience which makes it a good weekend rental. <laughs>